Okay, I'll get going with today's class. Hope you can hear me clearly. Last class, we talked about images formed by reflection, uh, reflection in mirrors. And today's class, we're gonna continue the story. We're gonna talk about images formed by refraction. Um, refraction, for example, in lenses. Um, some of the topics that will come up today as we talk about images formed by refraction are, are topics that are kind of, you know, of everyday interest. So I remember my mom telling me that the water is deeper than you think. And we're gonna explain why my mom was right. The water is deeper than you think. So we'll see why that is based on objects and images and refraction. Um, related to that, we'll also discover, you might not know this, but um, the moon is actually closer than you think. So we'll see why based on refraction, the moon is closer than we think. Um, another comment about the things we'll learn in today's class. So refraction by uh, lenses, for example, is that understanding the refraction by lenses was really the, the birth or a breakthrough in two areas of science. One of them was in astronomy. Modern astronomy really started with the telescope, which is based on lenses and refraction. And also um, biology, modern biology started with the birth of the microscope, which is based on lenses and refraction. So it was a watershed moment. Uh, it was a landmark moment when we understood how uh, images could be formed by refraction with lenses, because it led to these devices, telescopes, microscopes that opened up, uh, biology opened up astronomy. So specifically today's class, I'm going to start by talking about the simplest case, which is images formed by a single refraction, just one refraction at a surface, a boundary between two different materials, two different media. And we'll look at um, how we can trace the formation of images by that refraction, how we can write down equations for the formation of images by that refraction, and an example or two. Uh, we'll then move on to the case of images formed by two refractions. This is the case of lenses. When light passes through a lens, it gets bent when it enters the lens and bent when it exits the lens. That's a refraction when it enters the lens, a refraction when it exits the lens. And so we're gonna talk about the cases of lenses, which is two refractions. And again, there we'll look at how to explore the images by ray tracing. We'll look at how to explore the images by equations, formulas, and we'll look at some, some examples. And then if at the time, at the end, if I've got time, I'll go back to this idea that understanding of lenses and refraction led to modern astronomy led to modern um, biology. And I'll talk a little bit about microscopes and telescopes if I've got time. Okay, all of today's class is really based on, seated in, one law of physics, Snell's law of refraction. And so I'm just on this slide reminding you about that law of physics, the Snell's law of refraction. and the law of refraction concerns the, the bending of a light ray, the changing the direction of a light ray when it travels from one optical medium to a second optical medium. And so on this figure here, this horizontal line is the boundary between two different media with two different refractive indices. I've indicated them here, 
Ni and Nr for the refractive index of the incident and the refractive index of the refracted medium. Um, here comes the light ray approaching the boundary. Here's the refraction of the light ray at the boundary, and here's the refracted light ray emerging from the boundary. And so that is refraction. And when we talk about refraction, we talk about the normal to the medium, so the vertical line here. We talk about the incident angle as the angle with respect to that normal, the incoming light. And we talked about the refracted angle as the um, uh, angle of the light emerging uh, from the boundary. And the law of refraction is this one here, if you remember it. It's if you take the product of the refractive index and the sine of the angle in the incident medium, and if you take the product of the refractive index and the sine of the angle in the refracted medium, then those two products are the same. That's how the directions are linked to the refractive indices. That's how the refractive indices determine the, the relation between the directions. And that's, that's, that's Snell's law. The picture I drew here was light traveling from lower refractive index to higher refractive index. The light was traveling faster in the lower refractive index, slower in the um, higher refractive index. It's then bent towards the normal, like the life sailor. Uh, like the lifeguard would, would run further on the beach and then swim less far in the water. And so this is light traveling from lower to higher refractive index. Okay, let's, so now let's put that to work, right? That's the basis for the Harlow class. Uh, now we're gonna put that to work and we're gonna start with images formed by a single reflection at a planar flat surface. And so in this picture, in this overhead, I'm sketching the formation of the image by single refraction at a flat planar surface. I'm ray tracing the formation of the image by a single refraction at the flat surface. And, and so let me, show you how that works. So first of all, there are two different optical media in this sketch. So over here on the right, let me start there. Let's imagine that this medium is water. So that has a characteristic refractive index and its value is 1.33. And then over here on the left, this is a second optical medium. This is air, and that has a refractive index that's very, very close to one. So those are the two media. And this line here is the boundary between the two media. There's water on the right, air on the left. Okay. In this particular case, the object that we're going to make the image of the object is located here in, in the water, in the medium that the light starts from. And we'll see that the image is going to be formed here. It's also actually in the water, appears to be in the water, uh, in the medium from where the light started. And so we're going to trace how this image in Magenna is produced by this object in, in green here. And we're gonna do it by tracing two light rays. That's all we're gonna do. We're just gonna trace a couple of light rays as they emerge from the water into the air on the left where they're seen by our eye. And by tracing those two light rays, we're gonna figure out where the image is formed, whether the image is magnified, minified, whether the image is upright or inverted, all those features of an image that we met last class. Okay, so let's do two rays. This is the first ray. So this comes out 
parallel to the optical axis. And that's always a simple ray to draw. So as this light ray travels out parallel to the optical axis, when it passes through the inner face between the two media, the boundary between the two media, so it's arriving at zero degrees incident angle, it emerges at zero degrees refracted angle. Special case of light arriving at a boundary between two media where the angle is zero degrees is that the direction isn't changed, not changed, it emerges at zero degrees. So that's a very simple light ray to, um, to sketch. Second light ray we're going to sketch. It's this one heading up here. Now, this one heads up through the water and strikes the interface between the two media at an angle that is not zero degrees. So this angle theta i, this incident angle is greater than zero degrees. So this light ray is bent as it travels through the medium and it's bent and emerges at this angle theta r as it emerges into the air on the left-hand side. And because it's traveling from higher refractive index to lower refractive index, then it's bent away from the normal. And so that's what I'm sketching here. The light approaches at a smaller angle, the light uh, emerges at a larger angle. And so this is the emerging light ray as the light travels from higher to lower refractive index. Now these two light rays are, and many other light rays are collected by your eye. And your eye, your giant eye and giant brain figuring out uh, where those light rays come from. And so you're retracing the light rays along straight lines to a common point. And here it is. Both the horizontal light ray and the non-horizontal light ray, if you trace them back, if your mind traces them back, your brain traces them back, they come from this location here. And so that tells us that the image of the object appears to be located, located here. And as you can see in the picture, it's the that image has some certain characteristics. It's closer to you than the object. That's one interesting characteristic. So this distance Q is the image distance in size is smaller than this, this distance P. That was the object distance. It's the same size as the object. Image is same size as the object. So it's neither magnified nor minified. Its magnification is one. And it's upright, the same way up as the object. And so those are all the characteristics of this image we just formed. And we've done it by, by ray tracing. And so that's a, the power of ray tracing. Like with mirrors, you can not only trace the formation of images, but you could write equations for the formation of images. And both those things are handy, useful. And on this slide, I'm writing down the equations for the formations of the images. And, and there's two of them. There's these two over here on the left. No, this is the right, in the water. So the, the first equation is the relationship between the image and object positions. And the second equation is the equation for the magnification of the uh, image of the object. And in general, these could depend on the, the refractive indices of the two media. Now, I'm not deriving these two equations over here. At least I'm not deriving for you them for you in this class, but I did derive them over here. It's based on a little bit of geometry of right angle triangles that are inside this ray tracing sketch. I'm not going to go into the right angle triangles right now. If um, for some reason you're bored tonight, uh, you might want to look at it, just see how it works. But important thing is we saw in the ray tracing how the image formed, the characteristic properties of the image. And these formulas, equations embody that ray tracing 
and how the image is formed in its characteristics. Let's just consult them and look at them, see if we can understand them. Let's take the equation number one. So it's the relationship between the image position Q and the object position P. And the image position, it says, is the negative ratio of the two refractive indices uh, multiplied by the um, object position. There's a question in chat that I'm about to explain, so I won't immediately explain it. I'll, I think I'm going to explain it as I explain this equation. So what does this equation mean? Think about, let's first think about the, the size of Q compared to the size of P. We saw that when the light traveled from water to air, higher to lower refractive index, the image was closer than the object was. And you can see how that works in this equation because the refractive index N2 is smaller than the refractive index N1. N2 is the air, N1 is the water. And so that pulls the pulls Q closer, pulls the image position closer to the eye than the object is to the eye. So that's how the ratio changes the, the apparent closeness of the image to the eye compared to where the object is actually located. Q acquires in this equation a negative sign. P in this equation the object position has a positive sign. And what that means is the following. So if we always have an, in, in this class at least, we'll always have an object's position as being positive, as we talk about single refractions and double refractions. So the object position is gonna be positive. The, the, the quantity P is gonna be positive. If Q ends up being negative according to the equation, according to the formula, it means that the image is located on the same side of the optical boundary that the light emerged from. And so that's this case here. A negative Q means that the image is in the water side, what we call the front side, what we call where the light started from. If the image position were to come out to be positive, we'll see this with lenses, then the image would be located in the other side, what we call the back side, the air side of the medium. And so the size of Q is telling us how close or far we are from the interface. And the sign of Q is telling us whether we're on the front or the back side of the interface. And so both size and magnitude of Q are important. In this case, the magnification, we'll see with lenses that it can depend on a number of things. But in the case of a single image, a, a single refraction at a planar surface, the, the magnification is just one. There's no magnification, there's no minification, the object and the image are the same size. So that's embodied in the equation two. Let's look at an example. Let's look at an illustration where we put in some numbers, get some idea, a feeling for it. Okay, so here I am at the ocean on a vacation that we can't go on anymore. And um, I'm looking in the ocean, and uh, I'm looking in the ocean, I see a shark beneath me in the ocean. And the shark is looking up out of the ocean, and the shark sees me. Now, in this problem, we're told that the shark is half a meter below the surface of the ocean. This distance is half a meter. I am half a meter above the surface of the ocean. This distance here is also half a meter. Now, the ocean is water, refractive index 1.33. The air, the air is refractive index very close to one, 1.00 roughly. 
and we're asked two questions. So question number one is, how deep beneath the surface do I see the shark? How deep beneath the surface is the image of the shark that I see? And the second question is, how far above the surface in the atmosphere is the image of me that the shark sees? Like, is it that I see the shark half a meter below the surface and the shark sees me half a meter above the surface? Or is it because of refraction that we see different distances for the image of me, the image of this shark that is seen by the shark, that is seen by me? So let's, let's figure that out. Okay, so all I'm doing in answering these two questions is applying this equation, which relates the image position to the object position and the two refractive indices of the two meter, two materials in which the light is being bent, light is being refracted. This is the case of me looking at the shark and figuring out how close the shark is to the ocean surface. So I'm starting with this equation that we introduced. And then I'm saying in this case, right, N1 is the, is the optical medium where the light starts from. That's where the shark is. So N1 is water in this case, H2O. N2, that's the, the medium that the light is traveling into. And that's air in this case. So N2 is air. And so I then just fill in, having identified what N1 and N2 are, I just fill in the refractive indices of the water and the air and the distance of the object, the shark below the surface, it's half a meter. And I calculate the image position. The image position comes out to be minus 0.37 meters. So I see the shark as only 37 centimeters below the surface. That's where the image is located. And the fact that it's below the surface is indicated by the minus sign. It means it's in the same materials the light came from. And so that's, um, that's me seeing shark. Now, what about the shark? What's the shark's thinking other than lunch? Well, the th shark, this, the clever shark, is thinking the same equation. This relationship between the image position and the object position and the refractive indices of the two medias. It's exactly the same equation. The shark says, well, look, the light is traveling from the person to me. So N1, where the light starts from, is air. And N2, where the light heads up, into or heads down into is water h2o and so the shark assigns n1 and n2 to the medium that the light starts in air and the medium that light goes to the water and then again the shark clever little shark clever big shark um, plugs in the numbers the refractive index of air refractive index of water the distance that i am above the surface my object position and calculates where I appear to be. And uh, I appear to be at a distance of 0.7, sorry, 0.667 meters above the surface. And so that's a very interesting thing about, you know, me looking at the shark and the shark looking at me. What the physicist would say is that oh, when I'm looking at the shark in the water, the shark looks closer. And when the shark is looking at me, I look further away. And that's because of the refraction of the light at the surface. And that one case, light is refracted away from the normal. That's the light from the shark to me. The other case, light is refracted towards the normal. That's the light from me towards the shark. So the, the sh shark is seeing me as further away. And I'm seeing the shark as closer. And it's the same reason your mum told you 
that water is deeper than you think. So don't step into it. It's exactly the same reason. The water is deeper than you think. The image of the bottom of the pond or the lake or the whatever is deeper than you think. Okay, well, here's another application of this bending of light rays. Now we just realized, you know, the shark saw me as further away than I actually were. I was closer to the shark than the shark thought. Well, think about the aliens that are out there in the in outer space. Well, we're looking out at them through the atmosphere. Like the shark was looking out at us through the water. And like the shark sees light that is refracted as it heads into its environment, the water, we see light that is refracted as it heads into our environment, the atmosphere. And so just like the shark saw me as further away than I actually was, we would see aliens in outer space as further away than they actually are. So the aliens, if we see them, are, remember, they're closer than you think. And that's because we're looking out through not water or ocean, but we're looking out through atmosphere, air. And that refraction makes things beyond us, like the moon, like the sun, um, like aliens in outer space, look a little closer than they actually look, look a little further away than they actually, actually are. Okay, now let's go on to lenses. And firstly, just a little bit of lens language. There are two basic types of lenses. There are converging lenses that bend light towards the optical axis and there are diverging lenses that bend light away from the optical axis. So those that's the most important message on this slide. Two types, converging, diverging. Oh, there's an interesting question. Let me answer it. Are there substances with refractive indices less than air? Uh, yeah, there are gases that have refractive indices less than air. Um, vacuum has, I don't know if you call that a substance. It's a refractive index of 1.00000. And so on. So that's less than air. So there are gases definitely that have refractive indices less, less than air. Okay, back to converging lenses and diverging lenses, these two categories. The most, I should say, the classic, the classic um, converging lens is what we actually call a biconvex lens. That's one that has surfaces that look like this. The, the lens is thickest in the middle and the two surfaces both bend inwards towards the, um, the edge of the lens. So that's a, a classic biconvex lens. But I should say you can make other converging lenses, uh, convex lenses. Uh, with either a flat surface, here's one with a flat surface, or with two surfaces like this. In all these cases, the lenses are thicker in the middle than they are at the edges. So that makes them converging. Um, the classic diverging lens is, is this one here. It's called biconvex, concave. In this case, both, both the front and back surfaces here kind of cave inwards at the center. So it's thinnest at the center and it's thickest at the, um, at the edges. So that's a biconcave lens. But likewise, you can make biconcave lens other ways, alternative ways. You can make them with one cave-like surface and a flat surface, that's this one here. Or you can make it with a concave and a convex surface. That's, um, that's this one over here. But anyway, most importantly here, two types of lenses, converging, diverging, 
what we call convex concave. And converging means they're thicker in the center, thinner at the edge. Diverging means that they're thinner at the center and thicker at the edge. And of course, when light travels through them, it has to travel into and out of the lens, whether it's diverging, converging, and it gets refracted as it goes into and out of the lens. So there's two refractions. Okay. Another important property of a lens, I think of it kind of as the, you know, we all have our personalities, right? I'm grumpy and, you know, old. Oh, it's not a personality, I'm grumpy. Um, focal lengths have personalities. Uh, lenses have personalities too, it's their focal length. And it sort of characterizes them like uh, personalities characterize us. Um, so on this slide, I've got a picture upstairs here. Oh. This picture upstairs here, this is for a, um, a converging lens and I'm trying to sketch the focal length. And this is for a diverging lens and I'm trying to sketch the focal length. And in both the photograph on the left and the sketches on the right, we're indicating this characteristic called the focal length. Um, so in the upstairs sketch, in the upstairs picture up here, we see parallel light rays traveling from the left towards the right. They straight strike the converging lens and they're bent towards a common point. This common point here, this common point here. These common points are the focal length. So that's the focal length or the focal point of the converging lens. It's where parallel light is bent towards. All the rays of parallel light are bent towards that. And for a converging lens, the focal length is positive. It's on the side that the light is traveling to. Diverging lens. Okay, so diverging lens, again in the picture on the left and the sketch on the right, we got parallel rays that are traveling from the left to the right. They strike the lens, they're refracted by the lens. And in this case, they're not bent towards the optical axis, they're bent away from the optical axis. Look here, look over here. And they're bent in a direction that looks like they come from a common point. It's this point here, or at some point over here. They seem to diverge from that common point. And that again is the focal length of the lens, the focal point of the lens. In this particular case, this focal point is negative. It's on the side that the light came from. And so there's a couple of important lessons on this slide. All lenses have focal lengths. Converging lens bend the light rays towards the optical axis. And if they're parallel light rays, they go through the focal point. Diverging lenses, they bend the light away from the optical axis. And if they were parallel incident light rays, they bend the light away as if they're coming from a common point, the focal length, the focal point. The focal point for a converging lens is positive. The focal point for a diverging lens is negative. Now, focal lengths can be large or small. It could be 10 centimeters, 100 centimeters, could be 1,000 centimeters. So within you know, the world of converging lenses and positive focal lengths, there's all sorts of lengths of focal lengths, which would correspond to larger and smaller distances here. And within the world of focal lengths for diverging lenses, there's all sorts of focal lengths, from small to large focal lengths, which correspond to this distance here. And so focal length is really the key property of a, a lens. Okay, before I talk about and discuss the re refraction of converging diverging lenses, I'm going to give you one equation here, which is called the lens maker's equation. Makes me imagine back to like the 1600s and all these lens makers polishing their lenses for Galileo's telescope or, or whoever's microscope. And they're using this equation. So this is the lens maker's equation. 
And it's an equation that tells you the relationship between uh, the, the focal length of the lens, which is the key characteristic personality of the lens, and the material the lens is made from. So this is refractive index uh, and the curvatures of the front and back faces of the lens. How the lens maker has polished the curvature of the front and back faces of the lens. And, and here's the um, equation. So on the left, this is that personality, that characteristic, the focal length. And then on the right are these two really categories of things that it depends on in these two sets of parentheses. So the first one is the material you've made the lens from. So N is the refractive index of that material. So, you know, actually glass has, there's lots of different types of glass. And different types of glass have different refractive indices. And so that N is that refractive index. And then when you make a lens, you polish the front and back surfaces with a certain curvature, concave, convex, different radii of curvature. And so the second parenthesis involves the radii of curvature at the front and back faces. And so that's how the characteristics of the lens that the lens maker made give rise to the personality of the lens, its focal length over here on the, on the left-hand side. Now, if you're gonna use this equation, um, there are a couple of conventions about the, the radii of curvature that I should mention. So when light travels through a lens, it's refracted uh, the first surface refracted at the second surface. So R1 is the radius of curvature of the first surface. R2 is the radius of the curvature of the second surface. Um, if R, that R is positive, it means um, that the center of curvature is on the rear of the lens. If R is negative, it means the center of curvature is on the front of the lens. Uh, on the rear of the lens, it means that's where the light is traveling to. On the front of the lens, it means that's where the light is coming from. And so I would say the trap, the trap door, the booby trap in these, in these lens makers equations is getting the signs right of the um, two radii of curvature. There's a couple of interesting things about uh, the lens maker equation. Um, so, um, if you increase the refractive index of the glass, so that's here. So let's say I could pump up, right? Pump up the refractive index of glass, make it bigger and bigger. What happens is you shorten and shorten and shorten the focal length. As you pump up the refractive index, you actually pump up the refraction. And that means you decrease the focal length. You bend the light rays towards the focal point or away from the focal point more quickly. So that kind of makes sense. If R1 and R2 were equal one another, two radii would be equal to one another. That lens does nothing. You basically made the equivalent of a sheet of glass, flat, planar sheet of glass, like a window pane, something like that. Your lens would be the equivalent of a window pane. You know, light would get refracted one way when it enters the glass and refracted back the other way when it leaves the glass. So if the two radii are the same, R1 and R2 are the same, you've built a worthless, don't be a lens maker doing that, you build a worthless lens. Okay, so now let's turn to images formed by lenses and we got two cases here. The converging lenses and the diverging lenses. So I think on each of these, I've got three slides. I've got ray tracing, that's number one. I got um, uh, equations, that's number two. And then we'll look at a little demonstration, if that's a slide, that's three. Okay, ray tracing. Ray tracing for a converging lens 
positive focal length lens. Um, let's look at this diagram. It, um, it looks like, at first sight, it looks like something the cat dragged in, but it's not something the cat dragged in. It's a ray tracing diagram with lots of information on it. Horizontal line here, I'm going to get rid of that now because it's such a mess, is the optical axis. Vertical in blue here, that's the lens. And it's converging means it's thicker in the middle, thinner at the edges. When I mark the lens, when I place the lens on the optical axis, I marked its focal length. Over here on the left and over here on the right, because they're going to help me draw the rays. I then sketch the object location. Maybe it's me, maybe it's you, maybe it's a tree. And we're going to, and I labeled it O, and I labeled its position P. And then we're going to find out, we're going to figure this out, where the image is formed. It's actually over here. I labeled it I, and that image distance is Q, right? The object position was P. And so let's see how ray tracing, how tracing rays allowed us to figure out that, that image position. So there's three rays I traced on this. One of them, I think, is the you know, low hanging fruit of the ray tracing world through the center of the lens. It's kind of like the one through the center of the mirror. And then the other two rays are the, you know, the, the brother and sister pair of rays or the husband and wife pair of rays, or whatever it is, some sort of pair, a tweedledee tweedledum of the ray tracing world. Okay. So one ray strikes the lens at the center and just passes straight through the lens without refraction. So that's the simple one to draw. The net effect of the refraction is nothing. Second ray, okay, this is now the first of the pair of rays, the brother and sister rays, heads in parallel to the optical axis and gets refracted through the focal point. So emerges, is bent towards the optical axis and heads through the focal point. So here it is. The third ray is kind of the reverse of that. It heads to the lens through the focal point, passes through the focal point, then gets converged, bent towards the optical axis and emerges parallel parallel to the optical axis. So one went in parallel and went through the focal point. One went in through the focal point and emerged parallel. So those are the three rays they traced, I traced. And they converge here. And that's the location of the, um, the image. And based on that, we see that the image is on the back side of the lens. The object was on the front side of the lens we see that light really is emerging from that image, from that point. Our eye doesn't just think it comes from that point, it actually comes through that point. So that's a real image. Um, the image is inverted. It's the opposite way up to the object. So it's upside down. And the image is closer, formed closer to the lens than the object was to the lens. And so all that information we've obtained from the ray tracing diagram and that that converging lens bends light towards the optical axis and the rules for the bending of light towards the optical axis. Now you won't be surprised to hear that there are a couple of formulas that embody that ray tracing and here are those two equations. Remember the mirror equation and the magnification equation? Well, they've come back to haunt us. Now they're the lens equation and the magnification equation. And they describe the, um, the image formed by this converging lens. So um, the lens equation here, in, in our example, right, if we knew the focal length of our lens and we know the object position 
then we can calculate the image position. So it tells us to figure out how to figure out where the image is. And the magnification equation then would tell you if you know the image and object positions, the magnification. It will tell us that magnification. And again, remember, with all these mirror lens magnification equations, the plus and minus signs are really important. So you've got to get the signs of um, uh, the, the signs of the image position tell you whether you're on the front or back of the lens. The signs of the magnification tell you whether you're inverted or upright. And so these signs, like the signs of the focal length, are very important. Okay, one of the interesting things about the converging lens, and the ray tracing would show you this, the equations would show you this, is that with converging lens, depending on where you put the object, you can both magnify and minify. So you can make a smaller and a larger image. You can make real and virtual objects, images. So you can make them on the front or the back of the lens. And you can make them upside down or upright, inverted or upright. So the full spectrum of image possibilities are available to a converging lens. Let me show you a demo. Uh, I'll share a different screen here. And so what I hope you see in this screen is this is this light box. I used this in the last class and it produces three parallel beams of light rays. So one at the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom here. And then I'm gonna bolt in lenses, converging lenses, diverging lenses into this frame here. And we'll see how the light rays are bent, refracted by the different lenses. So I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna first point out what I just said, we got three parallel beams of light. I, I'm sticking my finger in them to show you that I didn't just draw them on the chalkboard. And here's a, here's a lens. So this is a converging lens. Remember, it's thicker in the middle than thinner at the edges. It's one of the lenses. I'm very proud of these lenses. This is another one. It's also converging, thicker in the middle and thinner at the edges. But it has less curvature, so its focal length is longer. Uh, then I got a... Um, I went to Home Depot, got a couple of diverging lenses. So this is diverging, is thinner in the middle and thicker at the edge. It's going to bend light away from the optical axis. And then finally, I got another diverging lens. This is also a diverging lens, and it's thinner in the middle and thicker at the end edges. It's not much thicker in the middle, so it doesn't um, diverge as much as the first diverging lens. And now we're going to watch I turn off the lights, I've cut out five minutes where I walk, walk my way back to the um, equipment, and I'm going to lock in, bolt in the, um, the converging lens. And look, you see this fantastic thing. I'm going to stop this, so just so we can watch it. Here comes a parallel light ray striking upstairs here on the lens. Here's the parallel light ray striking the center of the lens. Here's a parallel light ray downstairs striking the, um, the bottom of the lens. Parallel light ray striking the center just passes straight through. Parallel light ray striking upstairs here is bent, refracted, converged, and passes through this point here. That's the focal point. This light ray here at the bottom strikes the lens, is refracted once, twice, and bent through converge towards that same common point. That is the magic point of that lens. That's the personality of that lens. That's the focal length of that lens. And so um, that's a, that's a, I'm going to point it out again here. Again, just to show you, I didn't draw chalk marks on the board. There's real light. 
and that's the converging that's the converging lens we'll come back to that video when we've done diverging lenses so now i'm going to go back to my slides You might want to remember the fascinating story of the lifeguard when you think about that lens. Think about those three roots or those three rays we trace through the lens. The one that went through the center had to go through the most amount of glass, like the lifeguard going through the most amount of water. But it was the shortest path overall in meters. The ones that went through the top and the bottom went through less glass. So the light, the light ray was traveling through less amounts of glass where it slowed down, but it had to travel further in the air. It turns out, and this to me is always amazing, that those three light rays traveling those different paths at different numbers of meters involve different numbers of millimeters of glass, light rays all take the same amount of time to get from the object to the image. They're always taking a part of the least time. And now with the lens, there's more than one path of least time. There's a multitude of paths of least time. Okay, now let's look at diverging lenses. So the idea here is that we're gonna do the same same things for the diverging lens as we did for the converging lens. So I'm going to look at some ray tracing. I'm going to look at the equations that describe the diverging lens. And then I'm going to um, show you the, the demonstration for the diverging lens. So let's do those three things. Okay. So here's the ray tracing for the diverging lens. And remember the diverging lens diverges the light, bends it away from the optical axis. It has a negative, that's what this means, negative focal length. And again, the picture at first sight might look like something the cat dragged in, but it's not something the cat dragged in. Um, it's the ray tracing for the diverging lens. So let's just point out some of the features. Horizontal line is the optical axis. So that's an important feature. And we think of light traveling with respect to the optical axis. Uh, here in the center, that's the diverging lens. Remember it's thinner in the center, thicker at the edges. The converging lens was thicker at the center and thinner at the edges. And for that diverging lens, I've, I've marked the two key points, the focal points on either side, the focal lengths on either side. So those help us draw the, um, do the ray tracing. So those are several key things, these two focal points, the optical length, the optical axis and the lens itself that help us do the ray tracing. Let's clean it up a bit. And then what we're going to do is imagine we put our object over here. So I label that object as the object. I've labeled its position as P. I labeled its height as H. And we're going to do ray tracing and find the location of the image. Now, what we're going to do is find that the image, I've labeled that I, is located here. Uh, the image position is, is marked as Q. And the image height is marked as H prime as we do. And we're going to see how that image, image was formed by ray tracing. But already you see that it's an interesting image. It's on the same side as the object, which actually means it's a virtual image. Light doesn't actually come from the point where we're thinking about the image being. It's made smaller, it's minified, and it's upright. So that's the characteristics of that image. We're going to figure those out. So let me clean the diagram up again. 
and start tracing our three light rays. And really they're versions of the three light rays from the converging lens case. So remember we traced one through the center of the lens. Um, that was the low hanging fruit. Then we had the, the brother and sister ones, husband and wife ones, whatever. Uh, and they were the ones that went in parallel or came out parallel, went in through the focal length or came out through the focal length. And so there's versions of those for the diverging lens too. See how it works. Okay, low hanging fruit ray. Straight through the center of the lens, undeflected. So that's easy to draw. And that heads off towards our eye. Second ray. First of the brother and sister pair. That heads in towards the lens along the optical axis, parallel to the optical axis. And remember, it's diverging lens. So now it's got to be bent away from the optical axis. I'm bending it away from the optical axis. And it's bent away in such a way that it appears to come from this focal point on the uh, front side of the lens. So that's the rule for drawing that. Then the next ray, the next ray, this one's actually, uh, I have a confession that sometimes I misdraw this one. But the rule for this one, so this, the first brother of the brother and sister pair was parallel in and coming away from the focal point as it emerged from the lens. That's how it was diver diverged. Let me show you how this one's diverged. It actually heads towards the focal point on the far side of the lens, strikes the lens, and then is bent away from the optical axis and travels parallel to the optical axis. So um, the first of the pair was parallel in and from the focal length out. And the second of the pair was towards the focal point in and parallel out. And so that's why they're um, brother and sister or husband and wife. Anyway, these light rays are collected by our eye and our eye and our mind and our brain retrace the rays to where they appear to come from. And if you trace them all back, they appear to come from here. And this is where the image is. And as you see, we formed an image that is what we call virtual. It's on the same side as the of the lens as the object and light is only appearing to come from there these three light rays didn't actually pass through that point it just seemed to our brain and our mind to have come from there so it's virtual and you see that it's closer to the lens and you see that it's smaller it's minified and you see finally that it's upright it's the same way up it's not inverted okay so that's ray tracing for diverging lens. And well, you're getting used to this story now from the mirrors to the lenses. There are a pair of equations that go with that, the familiar ones, lens equation, magnification equation, that give us the precise relations between, say, the um, image position Q and where the object was placed and what your focal length of your lens was. So that's how you can figure out the image position. And then once you got the image position, you could figure out uh, the magnification. Magnification is a negative ratio of the image to the object positions. And again, you've got to remember about those signs. Firstly, in this case, diverging lens, we got a negative focal length, not positive focal length. Secondly, the plus and minus signs will tell you whether the images on the front or the back of the lens, whether it's real or virtual. Plus or minus signs will tell you whether the image is upright or inverted. And um, so signs are very, very important in these lens, lens equations, magnification equations, just like they were in mirror equations and, and magnification equations there. One thing that's interesting about diverging lenses. I think of um, 
I think of uh, converging lenses as the extroverts of the lens family, because the converging lens can magnify, they can minify, they can make virtual, they can make real images. They can make things upright and inverted. Diverging lenses are the introverts of the lens family. They can only minify. They can only make things virtual. I don't want to make it out sound like being an uh, introvert is negative in some way, by the, by the way, because I'm completely an introvert. But they can only, they can only minify. They can only um, uh, make virtual images. Uh, and they can only make upright images, but they're very good, just to be positive about these introvert lenses, they're very good at making minified virtual upright images. So let's see an example of diverging lenses. So I want to share a different screen. And so I hope you can see, I'm going to take this converging lens out of um, the frame and I'm going to put in a couple of diverging lenses because I want to show you both the diverging lens and diverging lenses of different focal lengths. Remember I had two of them. I, I actually forgot to edit that bit out so I should have edited that out but here I put in the a diverging lens. And let me pause it here. You're seeing a remarkable thing. I'm going to point it out, but I want to point it out with the, you know, with the mouse as well. Three parallel rays coming in. The one through the center travels just straight through the lens. The one at the top is refracted away from the optical axis and appears to come from some point over here on the left that would be the focal length. And the one through the bottom also bent away, diverged from the optical axis. And again, comes, appears to come from a point somewhere over here. That's the focal point. And so that's what I'm going to point out. Now. The one through the center, straight. And the one that went downstairs bent away from the optical axis. The one that goes upstairs also bent away from the optical axis. They're appearing to come from a focal point that's on the far left of this video. Now I'm going to put in a different diverging lens, the second diverging lens I had. Clamp that in. Now this one is less diverging and you see it immediately, right? The three rays are emerging on the right, but they're barely being diverged compared to that very first diverging lens. So this has a much longer focal length. The first one had a much shorter focal length. Okay, so that was fun. Get back to the slides. Here's just a table to end this section of important things about thin lenses and images formed by thin lenses. And specifically, I'm just getting the pen going again here, sorry. I'm failing to do that. I'm actually somehow got out of sharing, didn't I? This is a table you'd have available on an exam. It's an important reminder of the importance of signs in using the lens equations and magnification equations. So in all our work, the object location be on the front of the lens, it will always be positive. But when we form images, they could be on the front or the back. And if they're on the back of the lens where the light is traveling to, that's a real image. If they're on the front of the lens where the light came from, that's a virtual image. And plus and minus signs distinguish those. Likewise, plus and minus signs distinguish focal lengths. So a converging lens has a positive focal length, a diverging lens has a negative focal length. And plus and minus signs also distinguish upright from inverted in the magnification equation. 
So signs, signs are important in our lens equations. Okay, so in the final 10 minutes, I want to do a quiz and I want to do at least one example, probably just be one example. And so let's let's try and let's try and do that. Um, so let me start with the quiz. And so this question just asked you to sort of consider these two categories of lenses, converging lenses, diverging lenses, and address a basic difference between them. So as their names say, one bends the light towards the optical axis, one bends the light away from the optical axis. That gives rise to two to very different properties, capabilities of the, um, the two lenses. So um, only, only a converging lens can actually magnify. And a diverging lens cannot, cannot magnify. And that's one example of those properties. So only, only a converging lens was, can, can magnify. We essentially saw a similar thing when we talked about um, concave convex mirrors. Again, there was an introvert extrovert mirror. In one case, um, a mirror, one of the types of mirrors could, could magnify and minify and make real and virtual objects. The other one was limited to, to making minified objects. So again, the mirrors had these personalities. There was a introvert and extrovert mirror like there is an introvert and extrovert lens. Okay. <clears throat> so last six minutes, let's see what I can do. Um, probably not that much. Uh, here's just a little point I, I want to make. So um, you might have noticed if you go swimming and you try and see underwater, things look kind of blurry underwater. Why do things look clear in the atmosphere and why do things look blurry underwater? It has to do with your, your eyes, your own lens and the refraction when light travels into your eyes, your own personal lens. So um, I'm trying to show why images are clear in air oh. and why they're blurry in water in these two sketches here. So this is your, just in case you're wondering what this is, this is your eye. And it is filled with all sorts of stuff. I don't know anything about it really, but I think they're called aqueous humor and vitreous humor. And here's your eye in water. Again, it's filled with this aqueous humor and, and vitreous humor. When, when light travels from air into your eye it gets refracted at that boundary between the air and the, the fluid in the eye. And likewise, when light travels from water into your eye, it also gets refracted when it travels from the, the water into the fluid in your eye. But let's compare quantitatively the refractions. When you go from air to eye fluid, that's going from refractive index of 1 to 1 1.34. That's a lot of refraction those refractive indices are quite different. You get a big change in the direction. And that change in the direction allows you to focus light from an image, an object. So over here's an object on the rear of your eye, on your retina. And so you see clearly. When light travels from an object in water into your eye, well, the water has a refractive index of one point. 1.33 or something. The, um, the, the eye has a refractive index that's only slightly larger than that. And so the bending of the light when it travels from water to your eye, the material of your eye is much, much smaller. And so um, the refraction is much smaller. And so the light rays can't be converged on the back of your eye, on your retina. And so here you see a blurred image, whereas here you saw a um, clear image of the object, either in the water or in the air.
Okay. One quantitative example to end up with. This is me looking at a penny with a magnifying glass. The penny's image is twice the size of the original object. It's two times bigger. The magnification is two. We're told that. So the object position, the location of the penny from the center of the, the mirror, of uh, the lens, the magnifying glass, that's 2.84 centimeters. So we're told these two numbers. We're told the magnification M, we're told the image position P. And we've got to find the focal length of the lens. And so that's our job in this. This is an example of using the lens equations. Okay, so the, there's an important point before starting this problem to recognize. Not only do we know the magnification is two, not only do we know that the image object position is 2.84 centimeters, but actually we know something about the focal length of the the focal length of the lens. Now we, we don't know, I don't know why I got rid of those things. That was a mistake. We don't know, we don't know the size of the focal length, but we do know because this is a magnifying lens, it must be a converging lens because only converging lenses can magnify, diverging lenses can't magnify. And so we we know we've got a converging lens. So that's a, a second point that I wanted to make here. Right. So I figured out the focal length actually by first figuring out the image position and then figuring out the focal length. So this line here, I figure out Q. And then this line down here, I'm figuring out the focal length that we're asked in the question. How did I figure out Q? Well, that wasn't hard. I figured out Q simply by the fact, I know the magnification is two. I know the object position, 2.84 centimeters. And so the only thing in the magnification equation I don't know is, is Q. And so if I rearrange this equation, I find that Q is minus 2P. So Q would be something like minus uh, 5.6 centimeters if I actually calculated the number. So I found Q, minus 5.6 centimeters. Once I've got Q and P, I can go to the lens equation from the magnification equation. And I can fill in P and I can fill in Q and I can fill then find F, the focal length I wanna find. Now I could fill in the numbers. Here I didn't actually fill in the numbers. I, I fed in the relation. Now you might not like this. I like this, but you might not like this. So I left one over P here and I filled in that Q is minus two P. So I filled that in because then the equation is just a relationship between F and P. And if you rearrange it, you actually get the nice feature that F is just twice P. And so F is also five point, it's actually 5.7 centimeters. And so that's how I solved that problem. So we worked our way through the magnification equation and the lens equation to the focal length based on the fact that we've magnified the penny a factor of two. Okay, sorry I've overrun again. Um, it's a bad habit, I'm, I'm always doing it. Um, but we've looked at images formed by refraction. We look at the shark in the water and me looking at the shark in the water, that's images formed by single refraction. Then we looked at images formed by two refractions with converging and diverging lenses. And we looked at ray tracing, we looked at um, lens and magnification equations, and we looked at some illustrations and examples.